Believe it or not, today's Father's Day in Australia and nowhere else in the world. So we'd like to give all the dads out there a special shout out. And today is our good mate, Rob Mason. This is for all the dads who give all they've got and everything they are for their families. You know who you are. <laughs> Every time you hear the word dad, father, pop, sir, and even hey, you get it. So from all of us, thank you that you crack up. You're always there to open up. You even attempt to pull up. As the world changes around you, you do your best to keep up. You, Dad, hold up. You build us up. You show us what it means to man up. Sign up. And make the time to catch up. And in the most ordinary of days, and the most of ordinary circumstances, you take the time to look up and count your blessings. We may not say it enough, we are better because you pray up, stay up, and as we grow up, you dad, choke up. And when we seem to be at our lowest low, you even help us keep our chin up. You're there for the checkup. Hang in there, big guy. And the cleanup. And you take the time to listen up and read up. So dad, thanks. Thanks for sowing love, for teaching right from wrong, for being willing to go the extra mile. You surrendered the comforts of doing things halfway. You prayed for us night and day. You stepped up to be your best many times when we were at our worst. As life goes on, we know there will be troubles in this world, but we won't fear. We will hold our heads high and be of good cheer because you showed us the one who has overcome the world when you showed us Jesus. Keep going, keep going, keep going, yeah! So dad, that's it! Thank you. Hello, Elevate Church. It's so good to be part of your online community. I'd love to be there in person, but at the moment, you guys have got very tight border security. So us disease-ridden people from the Eastern States are not able to visit. But hey, one time I'd love to see you in person. But until then, it's uh, great to be able to share a few thoughts with you. It was a phone call I was dreading. My father had been unwell for some time. I'm living in Perth. My father and mother are living in a place called Now. It's about 200 k south of Sydney. And I knew Dad was battling with chronic fatigue and a lot of pain. He had to step down from ministry prematurely because of pain. But the phone call came and Mum said, uh, we've just had a diagnosis. It's not good. Your father has prostate cancer. Uh, it's an operable and mum took on the primary care, uh, primary role of being the carer. So for a number of months uh, in around right about 2012, mum was looking after dad and it got to the point where his pain and his condition deteriorated to the point where he was uh, placed in hospice. So I, I certainly made a, a visit and it was very confronting uh, when you haven't seen a loved one for some time and you see um, the colour of their skin, the loss of weight, and very confronting. And it was interesting too, because I remember I'm not there as a professional pastor. I've been a pastor for nearly 30 years, and I've ministered to a lot of people who have been dying and who have been through all sorts of traumatic experiences. But here I am sitting with my father, not as a professional pastor, but as his son. And we spent time talking. Uh, Dad recorded times about his childhood and family holidays with us. And, uh, you know, there's some very good memories. And at times it was a little strained and there were times of quietness. Dad had a little bit of dementia and got a little confused. And then there were times I'd read his favourite book, the Bible, which is the book of Psalms, very pastoral. And so I'd read Dad 
some psalms and we would pray and then we would break bread, have communion together. And it was a beautiful, a very beautiful moment. I went back home, which was really difficult to go back, you know, from Sydney to Perth and wondering, you know, will I get another opportunity to say goodbye? And we were very fortunate. We don't always get to write the script, but I actually made it back to Nowra two hours before uh, Dad breathed his last breath. It was a, it was a beautiful, it was a sacred moment. Myself, my three sisters, my mother were all standing around uh, Dad's bed and there is his physical body and we know he's gone. We know like, that is the very place that my father entered eternity, even though he was, his body was so fragile. The beautiful thing, and I guess the reason why I want to share this with you is when my father died, there was no resentment. There was no unresolved issues. There were no regrets because most of my time with dad was extremely strained. My father unfortunately struggled with depression while he was a pastor. He was very disengaged, very passive, very distant. And so I didn't really grow up knowing my father's love and affection or approval. Always had the sense that I had fallen short. I was a disappointment. And so even though I had a lot of anger and resentment, at the same time, I remember growing up afraid of the day he dies, knowing I will have extreme guilt and all these unresolved issues, and it, it would have been agony. But by the grace of God, we had many an opportunity uh, to allow the Spirit of God to bring healing. The defining moment that brought healing between my earthly father and myself was at a conference in Perth. It was in the late 80s, there were a couple of thousand people that attended. And I remember, you know, it was brought on by a whole lot of Americans. Uh, they were called the Vineyard, and I didn't know anything about them, but I was paid as a youth pastor at Warwick Church of Christ to attend the, the conference. I thought, that's not a bad deal. So I attended, and it was probably the second or third day, uh, one of the speakers, who I've never heard of, for about an hour, he shared a message about the Father Heart of God. It's a little ironic that I was, in a way, born in the church. I have always gone to church. Uh, for some years, my father was a pastor, and yeah, I, I just went to church two or three times a day. Oh, I should say two or three times on a Sunday, yeah, the morning service, Sunday school, the evening service. Sometimes young people would come to our house after church in the evening, and so that was cool. But you know, I've never heard a message on the Father Heart of God. I remember when I was baptised, of course, in full immersion, I was baptised in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And, you know, we were a church who always talk about Jesus, which is wonderful. But it's one of the first times, oh, the Father, it's an interesting concept. I've never heard a message about that. And as far as the Holy Spirit was concerned, well, in the denomination I was in, in Churches of Christ uh, in the 60s, and probably even in the 70s, the Holy Spirit was never mentioned because he was almost seen as some crazy uncle, some wild guy that you just didn't talk about. So here I am in Perth in a conference that I didn't really want to attend, but hey, I'm, I'm paid to be there. And a guy speaks for over an hour on the Father Heart of God. He shares his story about his relationship with his father. So immediately he became relatable and I, I got emotionally connected. But then he talked about the relationship between God the Father and God the Son. I've read these verses before, but I've never really looked at this transparency uh, where Jesus speaks about his relationship with the Father. And this teaching, which, as I said, went over an hour, I'm going to do my best condense in about 10 minutes, because this was the catalyst that led me in a time of um, asking uh, well, at least, first of all, saying to my father, I I have a revelation of the Father heart of God that I've never had. My understanding now is I have always been fathered. 
And I want to say I forgive you. I, I don't want us to dwell on the past. I don't want to talk about times, you know, he let me down because he was aware of it. He used to talk to my mum about his guilt. And it was just almost like this fresh start. It's okay, Dad. I've always been fathered. But I, I want there to be a healing between us. And so as the years went, we shared a lot of life, particularly in ministry. I was able to, he, he became like a, a life coach. And there, there was a bond that was beautiful. And so when he died, it was just this, I honoured him and loved on him. And there was no, hey, but you never loved on me. It, it was this revelation that brought freedom. So the, verse, uh, the first verse I want to share is John five nineteen. And reading from the New International Version, uh, as you know, there's all sorts of different translations and paraphrases, but th this is quite good. It says the son speaking about Jesus. He's talking, uh, I think, from in this context to a lot of religious people. He said the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. That was a revelation to me. I know about the teaching of Jesus, uh, his preaching, the miracles, the healings, and, uh, you know, water, uh, water into wine and feeding the multitude. But I never really saw the basis of the ministry of Jesus was a revelation of the love of the Father. And so as I began to look at that and realized that foundational to the ministry of Jesus was he knew he was loved by the Father. He could submit to the Father's authority to the point he said, I don't do anything on my own. Whatever I do, I do it because that's what I see the Father doing. In a moment, we're going to look at the next verse, John 5, 20, where he shares, because of this love, the Father shows me what he's doing. But there was this sense of the son, Jesus, knows he's been fathered all of the time. So this is my now application to it. I realised, so when Jesus turned water into wine, he did it because that's what he saw the father doing. He didn't just think, oh, this is a good idea. And I don't think God the father was up in heaven going, well, that's going to be your first <laughs> sign. It's like Jesus somehow, because of love, he realized, oh, the Father's already at work. The Father's inviting me into this work. He's already wanting to do this work. He's preparing the ground. And now I'm doing this work of turning water into wine because that's what I see the Father doing. Why did Jesus touch and cleanse the leper? Because that's what he saw the Father doing. Why did Jesus spend so much time with that immoral Samaritan woman at the well? That's because that's what he saw the father doing. Why did Jesus go to the other side of the lake and spend time with this absolute insane demon-possessed man? Because that's what he saw the father doing. Why did Jesus go to Jerusalem? Because that's what he saw the father doing. Jesus said, I am totally dependent upon the Father. For love and for revelation, I only do what I see the Father doing. Then we come to verse 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. The Father loves, and in the original language, the Greek language, ancient Greek language, the word is phileo, the Father phileo, the Son Phileo speaks about demonstrated tender affection. Not just, hey, I love you, like the, but son, I will daily, constantly demonstrate to you that as I look at you and your heart, I have tender affection. And the son knew that. He experienced it. He embraced it. So throughout the life and ministry of Jesus, everything he did and everything he said, he said it out of this revelation, I'm loved by the Father, and the Father will show me what he's doing. When Jesus healed the sick, 
cast out demons, raise the dead. He was being fathered. When Jesus experienced loss, he was being fathered. During a violent sea, a violent storm on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus was being fathered. Even what we might think are mundane things, when Jesus was asleep, when Jesus was eating, when Jesus was walking, he was being fathered. When Jesus was rejected and misunderstood and misrepresented, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane before his violent crucifixion, Jesus was being fathered. I am fathered and the Father shows me what he's doing. So ministry, all of this activity and drama that Jesus called through his words and works was an overflow of intimacy with the Father. The Father is already at work and the Father is inviting me into this work. And the work we do is an overflow of intimacy. It would be fair enough to ask the question, well, Rob, that's really good, but isn't that a unique relationship, the father and the son and this love? Yes and no. What the father and son is eternal. Jesus, the son, was fully God, but he was also fully man. And for these 33 something years, it was a different relationship, but sure there was a uniqueness. But here is why I believe with all of my heart that we are invited into the same relationship of intimacy that the son experiences with the father. Just before, can you imagine this? Just before Jesus is crucified, he's in the garden and he's praying. And one of his prayers is for his disciples and the church. And in John 17, 26, Here is the prayer, the heartbeat of Jesus, the son praying to the father. He says, Father, I have made you known to them, to the disciples, but also to the church. And I will continue to make you known. I'm going to continue to reveal in order that the love you have for me may also be in them and that I myself may be in them question. If this is a prayer that Jesus prayed, don't you think the Father would go, yes, I'm going to answer that prayer. You have prayed my prayer. You know my heart because of this oneness, this intimacy. Yes, I will love on the church. I will love on the world, but it will be the church who will experience this extraordinary love. Let's just pause for a moment. Jesus is saying, the love you have for me, I'm praying for that manifestation through the Holy Spirit to be on the church, that we too minister and serve out of overflow, the love of the Father. I, we are being fathered. So how do we experience the Father's love? Well, we've got to, we've got to get into the, the family. And we come to a term also expressed by John that we need to be born again. And unfortunately, that phrase has got a bad rap. You know, there are times people say, are you a born again Christian or just a Christian, which is a little weird because really you're asking, are you a Christian Christian? You know, if you're born again, you're a Christian. If you're a Christian, you're born again. But this term speaks about family, speaks about a father. This idea that to experience the love of the father, to get into the family and to enjoy all that the son has experienced, we experience a spiritual birth. We receive in an instant, once we put our faith in Christ, we receive the seed of the Father. 1 John 3 verse 1 speaks about the seed of the Father. Sorry, that's... uh, 
I'll give you that verse later. That doesn't sound right. I think it's 1 John 3, 9. 1 John 3, 9. In a millisecond at salvation, we receive the seed, the Greek word, the sperma of the Father. There is this spiritual conception that takes place where we are infused with divine life. It's radical, it's instantaneous, it's supernatural. But think about the term born again. Like I witnessed the birth of Emily and Jake, which was, well, it's hard to find words. It was extraordinary, easy for me, the father, to say. But as I looked, about, as I looked and witnessed their birth, I realised they're passive. They're, they're not doing anything. You know, they're in the womb and all of a sudden it's, well, what's that? And this sense of these contractions, this sense of you're getting drawn out of the womb and it's like they just go for the ride. It's not like they're, you know, they're, they're sort of going, okay, I'll do my part. It's just they're passive. And, of course, the mother is doing all the work and I know the analogy falls short a little, but the point I want to make is born again. It's all the work of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We're not born again because we deserve it, because we get some free inheritance, it's in our DNA, we've worked hard for it. It is purely something we receive by faith. Born again. How radical is that? And then the other part, okay, so you're born again. Now what we need to do is we need to daily, regularly receive the revelation of the Father, just like Jesus. We need that revelation. The Father loves his children and he shows them all that he is doing. 1 John 3 verse 1, how great is the love of the Father that is lavished on us that we should be called children of God and that is who we are. Children of God is more than a title. It's who we are. We are born again and through this Born again experience of being adopted into the family of God. We can now, like Jesus, cry out, Abba, Father. I want to say this, that each of you, you are loved more than you can imagine. There's nothing you can do that will make the Father love you more. There's nothing you can do that will make the Father love you less. You are loved. Why is this teaching necessary? Let's not serve or minister another day without knowing it's coming out of an overflow. That revelation, I'm loved by the Father, I, we, are children of God. Let's see what the Father is doing. But let's have in our hearts, I am loved by the Father. I want to now live loved. I don't want to serve and work and do things out of obligation for approval to be needed. Everything I do, I do out of love. I'm going to live love. We will now obey God and his commands because we're loved. We will give generously to the local church and to missions because we're loved. We will forgive people that have hurt us because we're loved. We will even forgive ourselves because we're loved. We will tell others about Jesus. We'll have people in our homes because we're loved. We will engage in the spiritual disciplines of prayer and solitude and silence, communion, celebration, simplicity, meditation, all the different spiritual disciplines, because we're loved. We will care for the poor and the marginalised, the disenfranchised, the uncommitted and the unconvinced, because we are loved. May that be your mantra for the next week or two. Let's really get that into our soul live loved. I am love. Live loved. I am loved. Live loved.
God bless you. God bless you, Elevate Church, with the love of the Father. May you continue to do the great work that you're doing in the amazing city of Perth, out of a revelation and out of a tangible experience that we are loved by the Father. Live loved. God bless you. Thank you.